Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to this webinar on assessing the environmental impacts of construction sponsored by the California Local Technical Assistance Program. My name is Tom O'Brien. I'm the director of the California LTAP Center, uh, which is based uh, at California State University, Long Beach. Um, and I'm at the Center for International Trade and Transportation. The California LTAP is part of a national network of uh, local technical assistance program centers based in each of the 50 states and in Puerto Rico. The program uh, is one of the Federal Highway Administration in partnership with state DOTs around the country. The LTAPs provide local, rural, and tribal road agencies with training, technical assistance, and technology transfer services, um, all in the service of improving the safety and performance of California's transportation systems. Our principal audience um, are uh, local agencies, counties, regional governments, as well as state DOTs. Um, and we aim to be the place to go for relevant information, resources, and training. Um, and we, in addition to providing training, we uh, disseminate information on best practices to municipalities across the state. Um, and we bring in best practices and knowledge from our partners and peers uh, across the country. In California, uh, the California LTAP is managed through Caltrans's Division of Local Assistance. And we have uh, partners at UC Berkeley's um, Tech Transfer and Sacramento State uh, College of Continuing Education. Um, it's a big state and um, we work in partnership to make sure that we have uh, broad-based coverage meeting the needs of uh, various kinds of local agencies um, across, across California. Um, the best way to stay on top of the type of training that we provide and our information and other services um, is through our website. That's your one-stop shop for training information. Um, if there's a, a program or a training need that you don't see there that you want to um, ask about, uh, please reach out to us by, uh, by email. And then we are active in social media, uh, principally on LinkedIn. Uh, where we share information as well. And we encourage you to um, follow us um, and uh, to, uh, to stay in contact uh, so that we can meet your needs as well. Uh, and those are needs in technical um, uh, tech transfer, uh, best practices, uh, information on regulatory and policy measures, a, a, bit, a, bit, a bit of which you're gonna hear about today. Um, we have a loan equipment program uh, we are uh, a, a broker for industry experts, subject matter experts, again, some of whom you're going to be hearing from today. So please stay in touch. Today's webinar um, focuses on the relationship between sustainability and transportation with a particular emphasis on construction. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, the relationship between construction and uh, greenhouse gas um, emissions and climate change. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the impact of California's regulatory environment and priorities on best practices in construction management and um, the needs of local agencies and the, the engineering firms that often work with them. Um, and we want to talk a little bit about how sustainable practices are being applied locally. We'll close the hour by talking a little bit about a new training program in development called the Sustainable Engineering Training Academy uh, that one of our speakers, Dr. Hamid Rahai, will, uh, is designing for us. Um, and this webinar is, uh, uses an approach that we've done with the design of a lot of our other training programs, which is to engage an audience in a topic uh, that is, uh, will be the subject of future training needs. And in, it's, it's in part an effort to disseminate information, but also to hear from you um, about the relevance of this topic to your, uh, to your daily work, um, and also to provide feedback on some of the content. And we encourage you to submit all your questions and comments in the chat box. 
Uh, our lineup today is a really strong one. We're going to start with Angie Villalobos, who's an air resources, air resources engineer with the California Air Resources Board. Uh, while we recognize we have an audience that extends beyond California, much of what Cal, uh, Caltap does, it looks at the context of, uh, of local transportation need uh, within California. And CARB's uh, efforts at establishing um, guidelines uh, and in some cases mandates for uh, transportation, the behavior of transportation systems in the state is something we wanna to touch upon first. Then we're gonna hear from Hamid Rahai, who's the Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies here at California State University, Long Beach in the College of Engineering. He's gonna be talking a little bit about the, the emissions uh, context in California and the nation um, as a setup for a later discussion of the SETA Academy. Jason Caudill, who's the city manager of the city of Lancaster, will talk about applications of sustainability uh, more broadly and also in the case of construction um, uh, using the work of the city of Lancaster as a model. And then we'll close with Ken Taylor, uh, uh, the design manager uh, at the Griffith Company, um, an example of one of those uh, companies, those firms, those engineering firms that work closely with um, and in partnership with municipal agencies um, in, and state agencies in response to both regulatory measures and also the priorities of local government when it comes to sustainability. Um, at this point in time, uh, a reminder to drop your questions and comments into the chat box. But what I would like to do is turn it over to Angie Villalobos um, to give us the view from CARB. Sounds good, thank you. I'll go ahead and share my presentation. There we go. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angie Villalobos, and I work for the California Air Resources Board in the Offered Implementation section. Um, so today, I will be giving a quick overview of programs or regulations that CARB that some of you might already be familiar with. Um, so the California Air Resources Board, um, to combat air pollution, predecessors to CARB were created, the Bureau of Air Sanitation uh, and the Motor Vehicle Pollution Control Board. They were merged in 1967 to form the Air Resources Board. The US EPA was later formed in 1970, and CARB acts um, through the authority provided by the legislature to develop, implement, and enforce regulations. Tasks that CARB does um, perform include conducting research to identify sources to regulate, certify new engines, and maintain registration databases, and conduct enforcement both in agency laboratories and through inspectors in the field. Strategies used by CARB to achieve air pollution goals include enhanced inspections and maintenance, sales mandates, fleet phasing requirements, incentives and recognition, um, cleaner fuels, and engines. The governor also set a goal to transition to zero emission vehicles where feasible, and CARB is adopting measures that will move towards that goal. Now, today we will have a very quick overview of the offer regulation and the amendments that were recently approved. And I will then show program pages and contacts where you can get more information on the rest of the program. Let's talk a little bit about the existing offer regulation. Um, this regulation applies to any individual business or government agency that owns and operate offered equipment in California. This is those vehicles that are designed and intended to be operated in off-road and have a certified off-road engine. An off-road vehicle may be subject if it is operated in California, it is self-propelled, so not considered portable, and is 25 horsepower or greater. There are a few exemptions for those two-engine vehicles, uh, which are two-engine cranes and two-engine water well dr drill rigs. Uh, that are subject to the offer reg, even though they may have an on-road drive engine. With the amendments in the December 2010, both engines of many other two-engine vehicles were also included in the offer regulation, um, and if they meet the following exemptions. If OX engine is part of the vehicle design, certified engine and 50 horsepower or greater, and if it's 
not a two engine street sweeper and is not subject to the public fleet rule. So these are the pretty much overall requirements of the reg. Now, the fleet can meet the compliance requirements by meeting a fleet average target that is unique to each fleet and is based on the fleet's average NOx emission. If a fleet cannot or chooses not to meet the fleet average target, then they will have to meet the back requirements, uh, which require retirement, uh, repower, designated in low use, or retrofit a certain percentage of their fleet each year. And our, our General requirements are labeling requirements, our annual reporting, and our five-minute idling policy, um, sale disclosure, and the uh, restriction on adding tier zero, one, and two vehicles. Now for the amendments, uh, these were adopted. The new amendments were adopted in November 17, 2022. So we went to the board last year. Um, Let's say, let's see there's tier phase out of all this equipment uh, beginning with tier zero, then one and two to su subsequent years. And then we have the expansion of adding vehicle restrictions, which is called a tier ban. Um, and I want to pause there a, for a little just because people get confused, the phase out and the, ex the tier restriction. Um, so the phase out is for equipment that is already in your fleet that is tier zero, one or two that will have to eventually be turned over and taken out of your fleet. Now, the adding vehicle restriction, that is equipment that is new and coming into your fleet or if you're purchasing, um, that would have to be tier four final starting in 2024 for most fleets. Then we have contracting requirements. We have renewable diesel use requirements. We will have voluntary compliance flexibility options for fleets that want to adopt zero emission technology. And we're also making a change to the low use provision. So we used to, or we currently have a permanent year by year, a permanent low use exemption, and we have a year by year low use exemption. So the year by year will be gone starting January 1st, 2024, and we will only have permanent year by year that would have a three year rolling average limit. This is the phase out schedule um, that's, that was approved. Um, so for year zero, one, and two, based on the size of the fleet, those are the years where they will be banned and the age that the equipment will be at that point. Now the tier ban ex extension is scheduled based on fleet size and tier, and it's effective January 1st of each year. And as you can see, tier zero, one, and two, those dates already passed, just because those are the current reg. The amendments are the tier three and the tier four I, which for tier three starts January 1st, 2024, and tier four I also for large and medium fleets 2024 and 2028 for small fleets. Now, this is the contact info for um, our program webpage. Um, so we will be posting within the next couple of weeks our 15 day changes, and it will have a 15 day comment period. So you can comment on the changes that we're proposing. Um, so I encourage you to participate. You can subscribe um, your email so that you get alerts whenever we post something in the page. And below is the um, email for the program as well if you need to ask any questions. Now I'll move on to portable equipment registration program. So these are uh, the portable engine ATCM, which is enforced by local air district. And you guys probably are, might be familiar with it is for any portable equipment generators, compressor, pumps, things like that. Um, and you need to get a permit for them depending on the, on the air district that you're working on. But if you work throughout California and need one and want to have only one permit, you can go through the CARB per program uh, and just get one permit that will uh, allow you to work throughout California and you don't have to get different permits from different local air districts. Uh, we have the large spark emission regulation, which affects um, forklifts, tow tractors, sweepers, scrubbers, and airport GSC that are 25 horsepower or greater and one liter displacement. And small fleets are exempt, which are three or less forklifts or other equipment. Uh, this regulation actually has its last reporting period this June, 2023. And from there, we will be moving on to the new zero emissions forklift regulation that is in the proposed rulemaking process. So this one's actually going to the board this year. 
And so if you want to participate in the rule uh, making process and um, get, get the comments to us about the, what we're proposing, please feel free to go to their program page or email them and make sure that you um, sign up for, to, to get the emails also. And then we have the offer funding programs. I've only included funding programs in the offer side, but there are a lot of programs for OnRoad as well. I'm just not super familiar with them, but I can get you information if you need to reach those. But we have the core program, which is a voucher program for purchasing or um, and lessees uh, for zero emission offered equipment. Uh, we have the Car Moyer program, which probably a lot of people are familiar with, and it, you have to apply through your local air district for that one. And there are a lot of incentives directed by local air districts as well that work with us. Now, a lot of you are probably familiar with the truck and bus regulation, um, which requires pretty much all heavy duty vehicles to have a 2010 engine or newer now. And a lot of their exemptions were sunsetting, I think, this year. And so after that, what is currently in the in the in the works is the advanced clean fleets regulation. Um, that's like the next phase or the continuation, pretty much. So, and that one is in the works right now. So it's open to rulemaking process. So if you can participate, that will be greatly appreciated. I'm pretty sure that you guys are very interested in that as well. Uh, we have the transfer refrigeration unit program that actually had amendments in 2021. And so there are some new requirements if you uh, have refrigeration units. Uh, we used to have the periodic smoke, smoke inspection program, which actually ending, I think, this year. And it's transitioning in what was currently uh, recently adopted as the heavy duty inspection and maintenance program. So for their requirements of those, I will I definitely encourage you to visit their program or email them if you have any questions. Now I will open this time for questions since I'm not an expert on all of these programs. If you have questions outside of the offered and LSI regulation, it will be great if you can send me an email uh, with your question and I will find the right contact program uh, to send your question so they can answer it. I really appreciate your time and thank you. Thanks, Angie. Um, there is a question that's been posted in the chat, and um, in the interest of time and to make sure we get everybody in, what we're going to do is move on to the next speaker, um, Hamid Rahai, and encourage a dynamic uh, discussion taking place in chat along the side. Um, and then, as always, uh, as Angie said, you could email her as well with follow-up. So thank you, Angie, mm -hmm. for providing some really valuable context um, for the discussion. And um, Hamid, now I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dom. Um, let me bring the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I'm Hamid Rahai from College of Engineering at Cal State Long Beach. I am also the Director of Center for Energy and Environmental Research and Services. Um, where the Sustainable Engineering Training Academy will be housed. And the goal of SETA is adapting a sustainability mindsets in all aspects of engineering activities and thinking of the way we think and the way we act. Um, before we get to the SETA, I just want to review some of the sources of emissions that we have. Angie talked about the on-road and off-road vehicles and regulations. And I want to show you some data from 2019. This is the data for the United States that, as you can see here, that the majority of the CO2 and CO2 emissions that you can, oh, sorry, I went back. Let me go back. Um, comes from uh, transportation, uh, trans petroleum-based transportation constitute about 43.7%, uh, followed by natural gas that you can see here. Uh, so petroleum and natural gas uh, are the major sources of emission and the most uh, petroleum consuming industry, as you can see, is transportation. 
Similar things you can see in California. This is the inventory of greenhouse gas emission in California for 20 years between 2000 and 2019. And you can see that 41% of the greenhouse gas emissions in California comes from transportation, followed by 24% from industry. And then you can see the contribution of residential, commercial, and electricity generation, whether it's local or in-state or import. And then the, the, the rest of them are from agriculture and forestry and other activities. So just to give you some background on, on this is that generally that uh, you can see that um, when we burn a gallon of the gasoline, we produce about 8.7 kilograms of CO2. And if you do it for the diesel, the same, it would be 9.9 .9 kilograms of CO2, but diesel engines are more efficient. Obviously, you can get less fuel for the same miles traveled, but diesel engines produce NOx, which is N2O is a greenhouse gas and also particulate. And obviously with filtration and various after treatment um, equipments, we have been able to reduce NOx and PM significantly. What about electric vehicle? Electric vehicle have no emission, but electric vehicle uses battery as the source of energy. And generally when we have batteries produced or recycled, we, we, we produce greenhouse gas emission. Something that we will discuss uh, later on as we go through the training. So we will talk about carbon footprint of any device or process. And when we talk about carbon footprint, we are talking about the initial footprint, uh, operating footprint, and then the final footprint after it's decommissioning. Contribution of each item could be different, but mostly we look at operation or operating carbon footprint, which seems to be, which usually is the dominant and is the one that contribute the most to the daily local greenhouse gas emission inventory and air quality. So this is just overall view, an overview of the construction phases and emissions. Generally in a construction phase, in construction projects, um, we could see one or all of these uh, phases. We start with, uh, we could have site preparations that include demolitions. We have grading, trenching, building, paving, and architectural coding. And then we have sources of emissions from these activities that come from off-road vehicles, on-road vehicles or equipments. And then we have fugitive dust, architectural coding, and asphalt paving emissions. If you look at Caltrans build projects, and uh, it's uh, a lot of sequence uh, of operation before you get to the build, uh, build projects, which is to start with the project needs, decision to prepare project initiation documents and the team that's put together, and then the uh, initial document developments and reports and approval process and implementation and the design and bidding and final, finally construction and uh, project close up. The, among the project document is the environmental document. Environmental documents look at the alternatives when the projects could have adverse impacts on endangered species, public parks, recreation areas, uh, wildlife, aquatic ecosystem, farmland, and so on. So when we talk about sustainability, it would be part of this um, documents where we look at alternatives where we can reduce the environmental impacts of constructions. Um, so I stop here before I get to SETA and description of the SETA and I transition to the next speaker to give you some examples before we come back to SETA and talk about that. Thank you, Hamid. Um, we are going to now move to uh, Jason Cottle with the city of Lancaster to see how this combination of uh, city priorities, regulatory environment plays out on the ground for local government. Hey, let me share my screen real quick. Has everybody got that? Yes. Great. 
Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for the time and energy. Um, the uh, Lancaster is kind of a unique place and what I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna kind of present the, um, the history of what we've done uh, from an energy perspective. And then also talk about the future because I think there's, there's opportunities as we communicate these regulatory affairs and some of these challenges we're facing, um, the grid is facing a challenge as well because all this demand on the system needs to be powered if we wanna be uh, sustainable. Um, and we're seeing a transition in this fuel market, this kind of fuels transition where hydrogen is becoming kind of the, the next opportunity. I think as, as engineering students, as people uh, in school, I think there's gonna be some opportunities here that we need to be paying attention to. So I'm Jason Cottle, I'm the city manager for Lancaster and we've been aggressively seeking uh, sustainable uh, goals for a number of years now. Um, we're the first city to implement a net zero home requirement. So every home in Lancaster, I think two years before the state required it, was required to be net zero. Um, we also formed an energy company with, uh, which is called Lancaster Energy, which is a community choice aggregator where Lancaster is now buying and selling all of the electrons for its citizens. Um, and then we formed CalChoice, which is a joint powers authority, which manages nine other cities' energy portfolios uh, where they are procuring and selling energy to their residents as well. Um, and we were able to achieve 100% um, renewable or 100% net zero uh, energy production. So that was a good, uh, good opportunity for us. We also invested in our bus system. Uh, you heard a little bit about the, the large transportation system. We were, we're the first city and the first agency to have a fully electric bus fleet. Um, there's approximately 120 buses that are fully electric and operating on the streets today. They've had close to you know, 10 million emission-free miles in Lancaster. Um, so we've kind of got a pedigree of, of doing energy um, in Lancaster, but also statewide. The reality is, is that's not enough, right? When we talk about off-highway vehicles, we talk about those vehicles that are on highway. Um, and uh, the professor mentioned the, the opportunities that are happening in buildings and emissions in buildings. And those things, those are all also impacts um, that we need to address. It's not just the electric grid. Um, and the solution for a sustainable construction industry is not just electric vehicles, electric trucks, things of that nature. There is this new economy that's forming in Renewable H2 um, that really has an opportunity for us in the state, but also us in Lancaster and us in the construction industry. So, but it starts with manufacturing of hydrogen. And I'll, I'll back up a little bit just for real detail about what hydrogen is. Um, hydrogen can be, is a molecule obviously that burns. Um, the way it is typically utilized is through the specifically green hydrogen. It is manufactured with electrons and heat. Um, so those electrons are formed through photovoltaic, through hot wind, through geothermal, all those traditional renewable sources. Um, it is then extracted from the uh, H2O molecule, molecule, which is water. Um, hydrogen is formed, it is stored as a gas or a liquid, and then it is eventually used through a fuel cell. That fuel cell then converts the, elect the, the molecule from its current form to an electron, which the only emission then is water. So it's a unique process. It's not unique, it's not new, um, but it's, it's gaining, gaining steam as it relates to the opportunity. Well, Lancaster has a significant amount of land for solar energy. So we've uh, working with a company now that's looking for 5,000 acres to develop solar um, to hydrogen. And we're working on a, an overlay on the east side of Lancaster to, to allow that zoning to happen on the east side of Lancaster, which is that, that you're looking at there, that map is about 6,000 acres. So this company is basically gonna be manufacturing hydrogen. Um, and that's the key element to the first part of hydrogen and how it impacts the future construction industry is one, is it has to be manufactured. And we're working on a couple of different manufacturing uh, entities. One is Heliogen, which is ge uh, a solar thermal uh, manufacturing of hydrogen. We've got SGH2, which is a waste to energy play. They're taking mixed paper, um, basically burning it and uh, extracting the hydrogen that way. We have a Hitachi Azosa Nova, who's taking green waste and converting that to biodigestate, um, as well as creating a, a methane. And that methane is then converted to hydrogen and then the one that we talked about with the solar energy is element, which is using traditional photovoltaic cells to, to produce hydrogen. And what's key about this is that hydrogen then can go, as it relates to an electron, as it relates to any other source of fuel, there is some serious flexibility as it relates to how do we utilize that gas. Um, there's fleets, hydrogen fleets now. Uh, we are moving forward in Lancaster to do our hydrogen fleet. That's our only uh, hydrogen electric car or hydrogen car now. Um, we're working with fueling stations where we can fuel these vehicles. 
Um, we're working with an aviation company who's actually going to fly a hydrogen powered plane. And then we're working on some of these short commute kind of drone type uh, um, uh, short air taxis that are going to be uh, powered by hydrogen. So, you know, these, these fueling stations, these, this transportation system can really be integrated deeply in the system, not only for heavy duty trucks, like you're seeing there of actually transferring this uh, hydrogen from the ports or transferring goods from the ports of hydrogen, um, but also you creating a system of, of distribution of this with its rail system and things of that nature. We're working with a company called Gemini, who's retrofitting diesel trucks to um, uh, hydrogen trucks, and they're saying they're getting up to 1,200 miles of range on a a, a big, uh, you know, a, a, a tractor trailer truck. Um, so you can see what this can do to the uh, industry from a construction perspective with Hoffa Highway vehicles and things of that nature. Those can be easily converted as well. The another projects we're working on, and I think this is key in the construction side of things, is the infrastructure utilization. So all every building that is new now built. Every structure that is built uses energy, obviously. Um, that energy is generated with greenhouse gases. Um, it also uses greenhouse gases inside, whether it be for heating and cooling services. Um, but we are working right now on designing a structure that is gonna be completely off-grid powered by hydrogen. Um, and you'll, you'll start seeing these opportunities come up as hydrogen develops in a more um, structured fashion. Um, and of course, it, it doesn't happen without partnerships. Uh, we, there's obviously some people in the field, some very strong engineering firms, Green Grid, we're partnering with to do some of these analysis. Um, UC Irvine, and I know uh, uh, Cal State Long Beach, I'm sure has a, a component of hydrogen and hydrogen research um, working on these projects. The, um, and of course, uh, we've partnered with the, the city of Nami in Japan. Japan has a very, very uh, advanced hydrogen economy um, that they're trying to build. And we're partnering with, with the Japanese government and the state of Hawaii. Um, on hydrogen. Um, and Arches too, California has a major program uh, developing hydrogen locally. So I think there's a huge opportunity for, for um, the next generation of engineers and scientists and things of that nature. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we're zealots as it relates to this. So, you know, we were, we're recommending or encouraging um, the idea that if we want to have a sustainable construction industry, if we want to have sustainable neighborhoods, if we want to have sustainable cities, we want to have a sustainable grid, you go down the list of everything, we cannot accomplish these goals just on electrons, batteries, and electric motors. Um, there is a new technology emerging that I think is going to be huge for our industry um, and the construction industry in the future. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Jason. Um, Please uh, continue to post your questions in the chat. We are um, on schedule. So thank you to our speakers, which I think means that we'll have some time for some live questions too um, at the end. Uh, really fascinating stuff, things I didn't know about, uh, Jason, about the work you're doing in Lancaster. So um, thank you for that. Um, let's uh, then turn it over to Ken Taylor, design manager with the Griffith Company. Um, to talk about another um, uh, application or other applications of sustainability um, in transportation and construction from the view of the, of the engineering company uh, and partner to um, local agencies. Take it away, Ken. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. And Jason, that was awesome. I didn't realize that everything that you guys are doing out there in Lancaster too, so appreciated your presentation. Hi everybody, I'm, uh, my name is Ken Taylor. I'm a design manager at Griffith Company. I've been here just about eight months. I'm a design manager for them and specializing in alt delivery. Um, I have 32 years experience in design. And so uh, this is a complete ca career change for me. And uh, I'm really drinking from a fire hose and having a lot of, a lot of fun doing it. So appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Today, I'm gonna talk about uh, just a few topics uh, related to how construction projects benefit from sustainable practices. And I've broken it down into three different categories for reducing emissions uh, at, for projects, uh, applying sustainable principles in planning, design, and construction, and then also impacts of sustainable practices to project deployment and management. Griffith's been around a long time. You can see this is uh, from the early 1900s. This is the LA River project where we were moving materials with horses. 
I don't know what uh, tier that is, but um, we got about 67% tier four equipment right now in our fleet. So anyway, um, the way we reduce emissions and projects, uh, very simply, um, one aspect and one way we do that is to balance earthwork for sites, uh, a balanced site. If the earthwork is balanced, we won't have any import or export or cut or fill necessarily that you know need to leave the site. So that helps minimize our trucking costs. It helps reduce emissions for the overall carbon footprint of the project. And then it minimizes offsite construction impacts as well. Less trucks on the road, less trucks on the streets and on the highways. Applying sustainability principles in planning, design, and construction. Uh, there are many sustainable principles for uh, planning, design, and construction, but the ones that are most impactful for planning and design include alternative delivery uh, contracts, such as uh, design build or progressive design build projects, or even uh, construction management and contractor, uh, general contractor, CMGC. And what these alternative delivery methods do is they, they foster a collaborative teamwork uh, between the design team and the contractor and also um, the stakeholders for the, the project. Early involvement with the stakeholders is, is key. Uh, the curve that you see here on the left is courtesy of uh, Envision, uh, which is another sustainable certification. Um, it's basically, it shows that you have the ability to make changes, but it diminishes as you progress from planning, design, and construction. As you can see along the, the blue line there. And the cost to make those changes as you progress from planning through construction increases, right? So there's a nice little sweet spot there in the middle of design, maybe 50 or 60 percent where, you know, you really should have things dialed in uh, before you start trying to make any more uh, changes, OK, because the cost is going to start going up. And that's why the collaborative process is so important um, so that you get everybody on the same page during planning and the first part of design so that you can move forward. And uh, if it's handled appropriately, you know, through construction, the construction will go a lot smoother too because there's just not too many surprises. <clears throat> the other uh, minimizing construction impacts um, through the implementation of traffic management plans, avoiding environmental sensitive areas, and uh, understanding water consumption and stormwater BMPs. Um, is is helpful for minimizing those construction impacts. Uh, the traffic management plan, if you have a bunch of traffic that you're dealing with, like in this, uh, this slide here, this is a picture along Wilshire Boulevard where the Purple Line 3 subway station is gonna go in. And you can see we, we have uh, temporary lighting on the sidewalk that we had to remove during construction, but still maintaining lanes of traffic. We also have some screen walls and sound blankets and things like that uh, to help mitigate, um, you know, some of the impacts of construction. There's also uh, BMPs for storm drain, uh, storm water, making sure that uh, we pick up any of that silt before it goes in, and also implementing. Uh, low impact development in the designs that also helps reduce the impacts of the overall uh, project itself. We also include dust control and sound blankets uh, to mitigate those construction impacts as well. Also through uh, recycling, reuse and material production, uh, we can help, you know, preserve our resources. Um, this particular picture was taken at uh, Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego, where we were crushing the stadium itself and creating a, a crushed miscellaneous base for use for the surrounding community and for um, for sale, basically, to help 
minimize um, construction waste, you know, less less of this materials going to the landfills if we can crush it and make it usable and people can utilize it for, for paving. We had a similar process for uh, the paving around Hollywood Park uh, that we basically crushed that paving and reused it for the parking lots that now surround SoFi Stadium. So there's just a uh, ways to reduce those construction waste and uh, keep it from going to all our landfills. That's a sustainable aspect of the work that we do. Um, impacts of sustainable practices to project deployment and management. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the benefits of tier four, which have been going on since I think 2015, but um, the tier four equipment requirements are a significant impact in reducing emissions. And you can see the numbers here where we're eliminating 739,000 tons of the nit nitrous uh, oxides and uh, 129,000 tons of the particulate matter, which is similar to removing uh, 25 million passenger cars from the American roads and also um, by removing these fumes and this particulate matter, it's estimated that by 2030, the standards would prevent 12,000 premature deaths every year. So that's a, a healthy aspect of the tier four. Um, the, the graphic here from John Deere, I got to give him credit for this because I took it from their website, but uh, basically you can see pictures, pictures uh, give you a, a an interesting um, perspective from tier one down to tier four. You can see the difference in, in the volumes and so forth that are coming off of uh, tier one versus tier four equipment. Uh, Griffith companies invested in tier four equipment uh, in compliance with uh, the regulations as of August of uh, 2022, there's 67% of our, of our fleet is uh, Tier four. We do have some of the other tier equipment uh, still in, involved, but um, I'm not super familiar with our equipment um, procedure and uh, program, but I'm sure they're going to follow suit. Uh, we're really, uh, we think it's important to follow these regulations. We currently don't have any electric or battery uh, operating equipment uh, in our fleet. Uh, it's primarily due to logistics required for battery charging stations and backup equipment that, um, you know, we have to account for in our footprint of our construction. Uh, we know it's important and we need to get out ahead of it and we still have some work to do on that. Issues that uh, will need to be addressed is just regarding uh, having uh, accounting for it on the site. Um, to make sure that we have the room to put the batteries, to put the charging stations, and so forth. We do not have any uh, hydrogen fuel cells at, at this time uh, for our equipment. We haven't converted to any of that, but we do understand that this is a, a sustainable technology, and it was great to hear from Jason today in regards to that. Um, but we currently don't have it, uh, any uh, hydrogen cells uh, powered equipment in our fleet. So uh, just in summary, uh, we reduce emissions for our, on our projects by balancing work, earthwork. Uh, that just allows for less trucking. And uh, we do have some tier four equipment, 67% of our fleet is that, so that helps. Applying sustainable principles uh, for planning, design and construction, the alternative delivery, the teamwork of the collaboration and the early engagement of the stakeholders, I think is really a key element of a sustainable project. Uh, help things move efficiently. You get the right project in the right place and there's no surprises and the construction can move um, smoothly and you can maintain your cost and schedule that way too. Uh, sustainable practices, Deployment and management, again, the tier four um, and all fields, that's a significant impact uh, nationally for us. 
And that's all I have for today. I'm willing to take questions or we can put them off till the end, whatever you want to do. Thank you, Ken. Um, also, some really good stuff. Thank you. Um, as we do our research and our fact finding and engage with um, the, the local agencies in particular that use the LTAP services, um, we, we try to better understand the, the training needs that come out of that work. Um, and this, this question of sustainable engineering and best practices um, is one of those topic areas. And, and it's why Hamid is taking uh, leadership in, um, in designing a training. So we wanted to shift now to um, a discussion of the planned Sustainable Engineering Training Academy SETA uh, with an eye toward getting feedback from you on the value uh, of this program, other areas uh, within sustainable transportation that you'd like to see addressed because it helps us in the design process. Um, and again, if you have questions, um, or comments, please use the chat. We are going to be monitoring them. And then after Hamid uh, finishes, hopefully we'll have some time for some live questions. So Hamid. Hamid, you're on mute still. Can you hear me now? There you yes, go. Yes, we can. There we go. Excellent. Let me go to. Thank you so much, everybody. I mean, thank you, Ken, uh, uh, Jason, Angie. They were all great presentations and to the point uh, to the uh, exactly those things that we want to address in the Sustainable Engineering Training Academy. We know that human activities contribute to climate change. Uh, among the activities, construction, building, transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, electricity generation, and all other activities, all these contribute to climate change. So we think incorporation of sustainability in all aspects of human activities is the way to address climate change. And our goal in SETA is to develop educational <clears throat> models and provide training classes for engineering professionals, practitioners, policy makers, and the students on applications of sustainability in various aspects of human activities. So, so far we have focused on three courses, development of three courses the first one that we are discussing today is environmental impacts of constructions. Then the next course is on green buildings and sustainability. And the third course is on a structural health monitoring, which we think is very significant and should be incorporated in any kind of construction project activities. It's interesting that, you know, as Ken and Jason and Angie uh, presented their uh, presentations. Uh, in addition to a lot of things that they talk about, Angie talks about the limits on idling is one of the practices of um, reducing emissions. And Jason talks about net zero buildings and energy generations. Um, and can uh, touch on local use of suppliers and reducing the, the traveling of the tier four um, uh, engines, uh, vehicles, and dust control and recycling, all of these are covered in environmental impacts of constructions. And I will give you an overview of the tentative topics in a moment, but then after that environmental impact of construction, when we talk about green buildings and sustainability, it incorporates net zero buildings and also the energy use for generating electricity and for operation of the buildings and various way of the reducing the carbon footprint of the buildings, whether they are residential or commercial. And as I mentioned that uh, the third course on structural health monitoring provide um, information on sensories and systems 
uh, up-to-date sensory and systems are incorporation of these into any kind of construction projects where we can remotely uh, monitor the structural health of these, uh, these uh, buildings um, in case of the earthquake and any kind of man-made disaster. Here is an overview of the first course, environmental impact of constructions. It has uh, three modules. The first one, we obviously talk about background information on greenhouse gases, the effects of transportation on environment, embodied okay. energy of construction materials, and what are these? Uh, as uh, Ken talk about recycling, this is where we address recycling and why it is important to consider recycling uh, when we are doing constructions. Impact on biodiversity, water contamination, noise and vibrations, methods for carbon sequestrations. We talk about California Environmental Quality Acts and requirements. Then we talk about vehicle mines traveled and threshold of significance for construction projects. And then mitigations, uh, you know, um, various I mean, ways of mitigations. Sorry, Hamid, can I interrupt for a second? We're yes. not seeing your screen. Are you unable to share? I'm sorry? We're not seeing your screen. Are you having trouble screen sharing? Uh, I I share. You're on live video. Um, I thought I shared. You were for a second. Uh, give it a try again if you can. Um, can you see it now again? Yes. Then just go to presentation yeah, mode. It's, yeah, it's back up. Okay, so let me just go back. I was talking about the the last slide here. Yeah. The last slide. Can you see this? Yes. yes. Everybody yes. can see this. Excellent. So we talked about the first course, which is environmental impact of construction. And I was reviewing the modules. There are three modules here that uh, the module one is mostly on background and uh, what are the sources of the emissions and how we can address or remedy or come up with best practices to reduce these uh, emissions. Uh, the module two talk about construction equipment with whether on-road, off-road vehicles. Again, talk about the emissions, the sources of emissions and how much they are. And so kind of quantify um, these emissions, fugitive dust grading, when we talk about the various construction processes uh, and so on. And the last module talk about a program that we are considering incorporating in, in our training is Cal EE mod program, which actually give you um, a number on what would be the environmental impact of your construction projects if you input the type of vehicle that you use and uh, how many hours of operation we have on these vehicles, the type of engine that these vehicles have and the fuels that they are using and various scenarios that you can try to see that if you reduce the sequence of operations, if you change the fuels, uh, you know, much more environmental the friendly uh, fuels and other practices that we discuss. If you apply those, how much you can reduce the carbon footprint of your construction projects to reduce the emissions. Then we end up with various case studies and work examples where, the, where these case studies display that various practices that have been applied to maintain sustainability in any construction projects. And the work example give uh, participant practices of how to apply these examples, um, these, case, these practices to be able to incorporate them into their projects for applying sustainability, sustainability in these projects. So this is a kind of short overview of what we plan for this set of the first course uh, in SETA as a, uh, uh, application of, I mean, environmental impact of constructions. But, you know, as we continue this, there would be various courses that will try to uh, come up with a way to train people and provide examples and information on to how to apply sustainability in various industries. 
So that is my short presentations. Any questions? Thank and you. I put two questions. I'm sorry, Tom. I put two questions there. Are these topics relevant? This is these, these questions are to the audience and any other topics that could be included that any suggestions? Yeah, thank you, Hamid. And I want to, we certainly want to hear from the audience on that. Um, I do want to emphasize that the trainings and in, including SETA um, that are offered through the LTAP um, uh, are offered uh, free of charge um, to uh, local agencies um, and um, public sector participants. So um, if, if you are interested in, in learning more about um, learning about this and other programs, again, please make sure to, um, to sign up uh, via social media or our webpage. Um, I want to get to these questions. I also want to make sure we take advantage of the presence of our speakers. If you have any particular questions for Angie, Jason, or Ken first, um, happy to, to engage those. Uh, there is a question, uh, Jason, uh, who was curious about how um, have the conversations played out regarding uh, H2's energy density uh, and energy needs to uh, to produce it. Very exciting times regarding renewable energy. I don't know if you want to take that one on. Yeah, some of the questions are a little over my head, so I appreciate it. I'm not an engineer, but the um, the the way the way we're looking at it, and we a lot of this is we don't know yet. Right, we 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 have a vehicle that we're testing, and the energy density and everything that's necessary is very effective. This car is just beautiful and drives fantastically. Um, as it relates to its comparison, and this is what we're doing right now with that green grid that we talked about, is from an energy perspective, the manufacturing of that, how much does it cost? Right, so then you get a molecule cost of a molecule to manufacture. You then have to compare that to what it takes for a petroleum. Right, what's what's the what's the equivalent cost for a gallon of fuel? Right, and then compare that. Um, on the energy side, this has never been done before, is trying to figure out what is the cost comparison with Southern California Edison uh, per kilowatt hour cost versus a molecule that might be a per ton cost. So it's that calculation that we're doing right now to kind of figure out the metric of, is this financially viable yet? Uh, because hydrogen is still up in the air relates to its financial viability, but compared to retail electricity, uh, versus off-grid hydrogen, I think we're going to get pretty close. And I think if, if we do that, um, I think we'll, tra we'll transform the way buildings are thought of in the future. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone in here in attendance have any thoughts about value of this kind of, of uh, material as the subject of a, of a training course. We will, as Scott said in the chat, we will have information on the specifics posted on the Caltep website within the next couple of weeks. But if there's something you see missing um, or something you'd like a uh, deeper dive in, please let us know. Any, anyone, any comments or thoughts? Please share them in the chat. Uh, Hamid, there's a comment there um, about uh, calculations. You may want to take a look at that. And then there's a question about landscaping. Um, I don't know if anybody, whether Jason, that's something you can address or can. Uh, I can talk about lands landscaping. When we talk about carbon footprint and carbon sequestration, we talk about uh, the uh, the role of trees and uh, especially maple trees that they can consume a lot of CO2 and they store that in their trunks. Um, so uh, actually when we talk about mitigations in our training program, we actually talk about the various way of uh, mitigating the signature, the carbon footprint signature of the construction projects and the buildings. Uh, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, this is one of the things. Uh, and then uh, uh, there was another question um, per pertaining calculations, pertaining, I'm not sure what the question is. Um, pertaining to what? I have Patrick's question, right?
Good. Um, I'm not sure about Patrick's question, uh, the, the calculations, developing EPDs. That's something somebody wants to take. Yeah, that's a good question, Scott. Maybe clarification of what an EPD is for those of us who don't know. Oh, okay. How to calculate greenhouse emissions, develop environmental product declarations. Actually, the Cali mod, uh, when we go through uh, analysis of the emissions, as I did the presentation on the how much CO2 is produced per fuel used or activities and that is construction activities and how we assess uh, the environmental impact of those activities. Uh, we go back to AQMD uh, references, we go back to CARB tables and so on in doing all kinds of calculations. So we introduce uh, all the participants to the resources available at the AQMD and also at CARB um, that uh, where you, they, they, we use these numbers to be able to assess the environmental impact of any of the construction projects. Thank you, Hamid. Um, Jason, there's a question in the chat for you uh, from Carlos at the city of Richmond. And I, I see we're at the top of the hour, so um, I wanna make sure that we adjourn on time to get people back to their work days. And so hopefully um, maybe Carlos and Jason um, can connect offline because it sounds like it's an important discussion. Um, please continue to um, share your comments with us after the close of the webinar uh, via email, connect with us through social media. And um, now I just wanna conclude by thanking um, our speakers, um, Angie, Jason, Ken, Hamid, um, thank you to all of you for, um, for being part of this webinar um, and for engaging with the California LTAP program. Uh, please reach out with any, other, with any other questions, as I've said. Thank you to Scott Jakovich, who is our, pro, um, our LTAP manager, um, who works behind the scenes to make sure this, um, this all happens um, from the technology side to the, to the organizational effort. So thank you, Scott. Um, with that, uh, we will adjourn and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, California LTAP webinar or training. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank Take you. care. Thank you.